AMU. American Military University is proud to present AMU Disaster Crew. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Glenn Koska, your host, and joining me today is Dr. Chris Reynolds, AMU's Dean and Vice President of Academic Outreach and Program Development. He is a certified emergency manager through IAEM, and his career in emergency and disaster management spans more than three decades and includes some on-the-ground responses to the Oklahoma City bombing, various major hurricanes over the years, including Hurricane Andrew and Hurricane Katrina, and various earthquake responses and recovery operations, including the Haitian earthquake in 2010. Dr. Reynolds, did I miss anything? <laughs> no, Glenn. I think you you pretty much covered it all. Today we're gonna we're gonna discuss the recent past, the present, and the future as we navigate through this bloody awful year that we've had so far. We are going to chat about topics related to emergency management preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. So let's jump on in, Chris. The hurricane season seems to be never ending. There's been 25, maybe even 26 named storms at this point, and we've had some major hurricanes. And, uh, you know, when they start getting into naming them Alpha, Gamma, and, you know, something like your f college frat house, we know we've, uh, we've got a lot of hurricanes on our hands because obviously the names start at A, and then once they get to Z, they have to start doing other ones. So, what has been your take on this hurricane season? How have we reacted and responded to some of the more heavier hurricanes that made landfall this year? Well, Glenn, that's a, that's a very good question. I think that uh, most of the listeners can agree that the 2020 hurricane season has been really unprecedented in terms of the number of storms. Now, we've gone into the Greek alphabet before during hurricane seasons, but we haven't really gone into the Greek alphabet where we've had named storms uh, strike the continental United States. So um, it's unprecedented. And I think that in terms of preparedness, I think that the states that align the Gulf Coast as well as those that align the Atlantic do like they do every year, they prepare. Most states that, have an act, that are involved in active hurricane seasons along the coast uh, prepare for the seasons well in advance. And as you indicated in your opening about, you know, the uh, essentially the four phases of emergency management with, you know, preparedness and mitigation, response and recovery. They're always in, in one of those phases, even in the off season, mitigating and preparing for the next season. So in terms of the, the professionals, I think they're, they're doing a really good job. Unfortunately, in terms of the population, I think that, you know, they're becoming weary. I mean, the poor folks up along the Northern Gulf coast of Mexico, you know, they've had a couple storms this year where it's created a lot of damage. There's been some fatalities that have also occurred, and they're worn out. They're tired, uh, just as the responders are tired. Yeah, and you really can't blame them for being tired. Uh, the people that live, as you said, in the states that are most affected by um, hurricanes that come through, they must be pulling their hair out. I live in New Hampshire. We don't get too many major storms. Well, we get a lot of snowstorms, of course, but it's very unusual for the remnants of a hurricane or something like that to hit us. But those people that live in, obviously, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, the Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, I mean, if you were to give one piece of advice or maybe a few, what would be your top three preparedness pieces of advice to give people living in the uh, in the crosshairs of some of these major storms that happen every year well that's a that's a that's a great question I, I think you know first of all as you indicated it goes beyond the coastal states because these storms come inland and they'll sweep across you know the continental United States and bring in heavy rain wind and a lot of tornadoes with them that create uh, you know additional damages. You know, my, my best advice to, you know, to people that are in areas where they're subject to either a direct strike or ancillary strikes due to, you know, the winds and the, the heavy rain and tornadoes is to assure that, you know, you have a plan, that the family members have a family plan that includes what to do, whether it be going into the basement for a tornado or it be going to a shelter 
or it may be going to high ground. You know, families should have an idea what they are going to do uh, when a storm comes or when a disaster comes. If, in fact, families you know, decide to shelter in place and stay at home and it's safe to do so, they should also have at least three days or 72 hours of subsidence, meaning they should have, you know, uh, dry foods, uh, non-perishables that they can rely upon to survive for three days in the event, you know, services are cut off or responders can't get to you if, in fact, you have damage to your home and you can't get out. And the third thing is to make sure that you have, you know, your medications and that you have, you know, things for children, you know, to keep them busy, games or, you know, cards or something, coloring books that will keep their minds occupied, you know, while you're sheltering in place or even while you're going to an evacuation shelter. The better prepared a family is to survive a disaster, the more apt they are to survive that disaster. So that really is critically important. Absolutely, it is. And you, you touched on a few things there, particularly your emergency kits, which I, I would guess that quite a few people in the country don't really know what to put in that thing and aren't really that aware. Um, you mentioned, of course, canned foods and medications, but there's a whole lot more items that could go into one of those kits, especially if it's some sort of catastrophic event that's going on around you, right? Yes, correct. You know, some of the things you want to consider too, and, and you know, I, I believe in practicing what you preach, and I preach the same here with my family in, in Tampa, Florida. You know, we're right in the middle of the hurricane uh, center in terms of where storms will come up the Gulf of Mexico, is being sure that you have your important papers and watertight containers, that if you are evacuating, that you take some of those papers with you, that you have, you know, form of identification, you know, that you have cash available because a lot of times, um, you know, there won't be the, the, the services for credit cards won't be available because, you know, the lines may be down. So you should have cash with you to, you know, pay for items that you're able to find should you need them. You know, and of course, you want to make sure, too, that whatever you have at your home that you want to, you know, make sure is safe, move it to higher floors or move it up onto desks, cover them with plastic and so forth. In the event that there's heavy rain or there's a breach in the ceiling or the roof that allows rainwater or, you know, some of the outside things to come in that could damage your property. So that's other things you want to consider. Right. And of course, I always find it interesting when there's a major hurricane approaching, obviously, all of the media outlets are covering it. And you've got people, reporters and meteorologists and people like that and emergency managers who are giving advice on this major hurricane that might be coming through. But then, of course, once it makes landfall, oftentimes the news kind of stops and really the story is just beginning isn't it i mean because once that storm it might lose a little bit of power and it won't be on everybody's lips and the day after it makes landfall but there's a lot of other terrible things that can happen inland with these storms right oh absolutely and you bring up a good point i think all of us realize that the 24-hour news cycle requires the stations or the networks to outdo one another in terms of whether it be the reporter standing in the 125 mile an hour wind being blown sideways trying to stand up and talk about how horrific the storm is, that has a lot of visual appeal, you know, and it's, it's pretty stunning from an observer's point of view, you know, to watch and see, you know, the fury of nature and mankind standing against it, you know, but as you noted, you know, once the storm makes landfall, pretty much the coverage, see, you know, seeks out the next disaster or the next, you know, story that's going to run the news cycle. What we in emergency management like to say is that, honestly, the recovery operation is, is the longest, and it takes the longest to go through. So in terms of the phases of emergency management, after the storm has come through and we go into a recovery phase, that can last sometimes years before recovery is finally truly realized. And I, there are a lot of examples, you know, Hurricane Michael that hit to the Panama City and my former duty station, Tyndall Air Force Base, essentially wiping Tyndall Air Force Base off the map, they're still in recovery. And there are storms around, you know, around the United States where that's an example. The human side of the stories are the real misery for folks that aren't directly impacted by a storm begin after landfall because that's when services are down. The electricity is out. You know, uh, potable water is not available. Trash pickup is gone. You know, there's no telephone service, cell, cell towers are down. And that's why I go back to, you know, what we talked about earlier, Glenn, of making sure that 
you know, you have a plan, number one, and number two, that you have sustenance, that you have, you know, the things your family needs to survive. You know, having a generator is important. And moreover, knowing how to operate that generator, making sure that it's outside, that it's nowhere close to a building where carbon monoxide can come in and, you know, hurt your, yourselves, your family members. Those are some of the, the, the preparedness items that families want to consider because it helps, you know, lessen the severity of not having services. And if you've got a generator that can run, you know, a small television or a portable, or a portable radio or a refrigerator, you know, life is going to be a little bit easier for you, you know, in, in those uncertain times. Absolutely true. And of course, you've been on the ground at some some of these disasters that you just referenced or you've referenced uh, how um, how serious they can be. So why don't you give us some recollection of perhaps Hurricane Katrina, because that is the one storm that epitomizes every other storm as far as how catastrophic, devastating it was to not just Louisiana, but bordering states. So if you can think back, that's that's 15 years ago now, but what was it like? What was the main part of that recovery operation that stuck out in your mind? Well, you know, Katrina was, was as you said, quite a storm. And, you know, the wind and rain was certainly bad, but the real disaster was when the levees gave way and there was that widespread flooding that occurred. I was a captain uh, in the United States Air Force at the time in an aeromedical evacuation squadron. And my uh, aeromedical evacuation liaison team was mobilized and sent to Louis Armstrong International Airport the day after Katrina hit. And we set up our operation at the airport doing aeromedical evacuation. People were being rescued from the different parishes surrounding uh, New Orleans and being flown to Louis Armstrong and we would medically clear them or check them, and then we would fly them out to receiving states or receiving hospitals. And it was a total and complete mobilization, you know, within the United States, including the active duty. You know, the 82nd Airborne, in fact, was brought in to provide security uh, down in New Orleans because, you know, there were concerns about uh, looting and, and some lawlessness occurring. In fact, it was General Russell Honore, who was the uh, combined combatant commander that, that ran the military side of it, who was our the main person that we reported to and, and what I did. So my recollections are just flying around New Orleans and seeing the vast flooding, seeing the debris piles everywhere, you know, seeing 11, 12, 13 feet of water, you know, down Bourbon Street or down some of the side streets, it just completely inundated the area. There was really no public services available. Law enforcement was doing the best job they could. Fire and rescue were doing the best job they could. And of course, we were doing the best job we could. Eventually, I flew down via rotary uh, lift down to uh, Bell Chase, which there was a uh, air station there where we were launching and recovering C-130 Hercules aircraft with evacuees, and it was a 24-7 operation. That is how many people were impacted in New Orleans. I spent about a month there, you know, and as I said earlier when we were first talking about, you know, the recovery phase, in some respects, New Orleans is still in a recovery phase some 15 years later after Katrina. That's quite an amazing thing to hear, but I can understand why, because my, my next question, in fact, was going to be, what if this sort of quote unquote, perfect storm, nothing perfect about it in you know certain ways, but you know what I mean by that, this category five, perhaps hurricane that's just heading straight towards New Orleans again in the future, are they prepared to deal with such a threat now? Or is it a case of there were some lessons learned, but some that weren't? Well, I definitely think they're better prepared. And, and you know, to uh, those of us in the emergency management community know that Katrina essentially re rewrote the book in terms of hurricane preparedness and response. In fact, the post nine or the post Katrina Reform Act that was passed after Hurricane Katrina made some significant changes to FEMA as well as to the posture of incoming help or the leaning forward of, you know, assistance that would come and help during a hurricane. It also strengthened the understanding and the responsibilities of, you know, local mutual aid to make sure that the parishes were all working together, you know, to provide mutual aid if needed, as well as outside sources. We have what's called the, uh, the Emergency Management Compact. And what that compact does is that provides uh, emergency assistance should it be needed from surrounding states around, you know, a state or a community that's stricken by a disaster. Now, in your example of a Category 5 hurricane hitting, I would tell you that any Cat 5 hurricane hitting anywhere 
that no community is really fully prepared for because the devastation and catastrophic nature of such a storm would uh, would likely result in a large loss of life as well as great loss of infrastructure. Uh, and again, we would look at making sure that uh, the population that were in areas that were in flood zones or that were in tidal areas were evacuated and put in shelters, as well as getting people that might be susceptible to high winds, get them, getting them in shelters too. In terms of preparedness, yes, we're better prepared than we were during Hurricane Katrina. Would we be successful in, in responding to and recovering from? I think we would. But I think like any disaster that hits, we always have lessons learned where we can, we see that we could have done things perhaps better in some respects. I'm Glenn Kosker. My guest today is Dr. Christopher Reynolds, and we'll be right back. To handle massive damage from natural and man-made disasters, today's first responders need specialized training. Get started down your next training path in emergency and disaster management with a degree from American Military University. You'll learn from highly experienced practitioners in the field. Take the next step and apply today at amuonline.com. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm talking to Dr. Christopher Reynolds. So let's jump right back into our discussion. Let's scare our audience even more. Moving on to earthquakes, and the only reason I'm I shouldn't be I shouldn't be uh, light about this subject, but I do know that you have been around earthquake zones, and particularly the one in Haiti, which was a fairly strong quake. But are we ready in this country for the big one, so to speak? Now, a lot of people, when they think about the big one, they think about California because obviously that's the, that's the state in the U.S., along with Alaska, which not too many people worry about, unfortunately, but Alaska too. But California is the earthquake state, so to speak. But then there's little-known area called the New Madrid Zone, which is in the Midwest, which actually had the worst earthquake in modern or United States history. A lot of people would think that the worst earthquake to ever hit the U.S. would probably, or the mainland I'm talking about, not counting Alaska, most people would think it would be uh, in California. But there was this series of earthquakes in the New Madrid zone in the early 1800s. It was a huge event. What would happen now? Are we ready for something like that to happen, Chris? Well, you know, first of all, are we ready? I mean, we're ready to an extent and to a degree, but to say that we're fully prepared for really any disaster, you know, is, is folly because, you know, the nature of disasters is that it brings the unknown, you know, and you can only be prepared so much. I mean, you talk about New Madrid, the New Madrid zone, you know, 1810, 1811, 1812 time frame when that hit, there really wasn't much infrastructure in Missouri, Kansas in that area. There just, it was mainly, you know, frontier. So in terms of the earthquake affecting population or it affecting infrastructure, there really wasn't that much population or infrastructure that, uh, that was impacted. Although it was, as you said, it was the largest quake that we've had in the continent of the United States. I think the earthquake that stands out in most everyone's mind is the San Francisco earthquake in the early 1900s, you know, that uh, created so much issue, damage. Go forward in history to other earthquakes, the great you know, Alaska earthquake, and of course, then we had the Loma Prieta quake that happened. Many people were watching game whatever five or six of the World Series when Loma Prieta hit. You know, the Oakland Bridge partially collapsed, apartment buildings collapsed, and you know that was a got a lot of attention, got a lot of news, and there were a lot of fatalities that came out of that. And that's what I talked about with Hurricane Katrina about the Post Katrina Reform Act. Every time there's been an earthquake disaster, there have been different laws or different uh, expectations that have been brought out from after action reports on how to handle it differently. Just like South Florida has a Southern Florida building code that's based on hurricane preparedness, on the West Coast in California, they've got a building code out there strictly to deal with earthquakes that talk about foundations and what's the best type of foundation to have on a high-rise structure that doesn't cause the building to fall during liquefaction or you know when the ground turns essentially into a liquid and it sinks the building. I think that in terms of, of a nation, I think we're better prepared in terms of logistics and being able to send help. But an earthquake striking a, a, a major city, you know, if the San Andreas Fault perhaps uh, hit and it reacted in San Francisco or Los Angeles, I think just based on the population centers alone, there would be a number of fatalities. The infrastructure would be greatly impacted. You know, just like you'd see in any disaster, you know, you'd have fires and you'd have uh, floods, you'd have you know, you name it, pretty much everything that uh, that could impact a community. 
I think that as a nation, we could handle it in the long term. In the short term, I think there would be a lot of confusion. And if you look at California right now, that's dealing with wildfires, you know, they've got an unprecedented number of wildfires that are occurring in the northern part of the state. And so they're already handling disasters now. If you throw an earthquake in on top of the wildfires, the loss of life would be significant. And I think that it would require a much greater federal response to bring in help and assistance. Absolutely right. Earlier, I referred to the earthquake zone in the Midwest as the New Madrid zone. Of course, that's my European background, and you pronounced it correctly, which in fact I did know. I did know how to pronounce it. It just slipped my mind. The New Madrid zone. And just to give our audience some context, that was an 8.0 magnitude, they think, because obviously there was no Richter scale in 18, 1811. But that's pretty much what it was, about 7.8 or 8.0. And that was in the winter of 1811 into 1812. And there weren't that many people living in that area of the country um, back then. Of course, now you've got the metropolitan areas of Memphis, Tennessee, and, and St. Louis. Again, don't want to scare our listeners, but preparedness is vital um, because there would be some unprecedented damage to that area of the country if, God forbid, another 8.0 earthquake hit Metro St. Louis and Metro Memphis. What is it that you are supposed to do if caught in an earthquake? I mean, what, what is the protocol that you should follow if you're in a house or in a building or outside? What are the different things that you can do to protect yourself during an earthquake? Well, sure. I mean, first, if you're in a building, you want to find a, you know, an interior, preferably a, a load-bearing wall in a corner where it will create a void if a collapse occurs because survival occurs within the voids. And, you know, you can have different configuration of voids. If you have the capability, you want to get outside and get out of a building. It's not safe to be in a building in an earthquake by any means because there's no telling what the mechanics of the earthquake are going to do and collapse in a building around you. And just to put it in perspective, Glenn, you know, you talked about New Madrid and it being a, uh, you know, an eight on the Richter scale. You know, the Haitian earthquake in 2010 was a seven on the Richter scale. And, and you know, and it, it resulted in about 300,000 fatalities, or not fatalities, but injuries. And then there were, of course, a lesser number of, of fatalities that occurred from it. But comparing uh, Haitian infrastructure to the infrastructure of St. Louis, yes, they both have infrastructure, but I think... In areas like St. Louis or Memphis, you have a much greater infrastructure. You have a larger population centers in those areas. And if that type of earthquake hit today, I think that, again, it'd be much like we talked about a little while ago in California. It would be unprecedented. So earthquake preparedness is is because there really is no earthquake season. It's always earthquake season is to be sure that, you know, you have a, a family communications plan on where you're going to be, what you're going to do. You want to know where shelter locations are. If you're if you're inside, get outside. If you're you know in a in a in a low area, you should seek higher ground because in lower ground, uh, you may be susceptible to flash flooding. You know, and that's something that uh, you don't want to have to have to deal with. Right, of course, because if you're on the lower ground and the earthquake hits and it takes out the pipes in your whatever building you're in, you got water spewing everywhere as well, and you might be trapped. Again, not to scare our audience too much, but what we've discussed really, Chris, is there are certain things that you can't prepare for, and there are certain things that you can prepare for. Absolutely. Preparedness is, is critical because it's something that families can do, individuals can do. Those that, that know me and have known me know that I'm famous for a phrase that I call, have a plan. And I use that all the time. And I know that sometimes my colleagues and friends may be irritated by me using it. But if I use it enough, I'm hoping that they'll realize that they themselves should have a plan. And whether it's making sure that your gasoline tank is always above half a tank, you know, during hurricane season, making sure that, you know, you have a, a flyaway kit or a go bag that has essential items in it, that you have enough medication for three days, that you have enough food for sustenance for three days if you need it. You know, if it makes people think that, wow, maybe I should listen to that and have that plan, then I'll know I've done my job because that's what's important. I'd like to thank you very much for being my guest today. Thank you so much, Glenn. I appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to working and chatting with you going forward. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Glenn Kosker. Join us again on a future episode. Thank you. 
for more information about our university, visit us at amuonline.com. Thank you for listening. AMU, American Military University.